Hello, good afternoon. I'm Vittorio Bertola, and I'm here to give you an update around the digital market, the new European Union law that is going to address competition on digital markets. So I already gave a talk on this last year in this dev room, so I hope you remember it. Uh, I will still be recapping a little for the benefit of those that didn't see the talk and don't know what we are talking about. If you really don't know what we are talking about, I encourage you to also watch my main room talk tomorrow and Sunday at, at noon, which will be a, a much broader discussion of all digital sovereignty aspects, and then we'll end up with an, also a recap around the digital market set. So, uh, I'm an engineer, I'm a digital rights activist in the, in the 90s, and I'm currently working for Open Exchange, which is a German open source software company. And uh, so where, where are we? Well, uh, we're still checked into the Hotel California. So, I mean, we are still, as Europeans, uh, bound to use all these uh, nice services provided mostly for free, not always, by the big tech companies that you really can do without. So it's uh, even if you want to do without them, it's basically impossible for a number of reasons. And uh, uh, that's, uh, I mean, the, partly it's the result and it's also the cause of the sheer economic size of these companies. So we, we saw last year that, I mean, the, these companies, uh, well, I mean, the, the, the five big the companies were the five biggest public listed companies in the world, and they had reached almost, I mean, well, over $2 trillion in value. And now, I mean, one year uh, later, we are nearing the $3 trillion dollar mark. So $3 trillion is like France's GDP, the, the entire wealth produced by France in one year. And uh, so it's growing at an incredible pace. And so the problem is becoming bigger and bigger. And we're getting new companies now. I mean, Facebook changed name to Meta. Uh, Tesla broke in and actually overcame Meta in value. So the problem is still there. It's, it's not got better. And uh, this is, and we're still stuck with these uh, siloed services. Uh, that, I mean, I usually use uh, instant messaging as a service because that's the easiest example. Services built as walled gardens in which you are forced to I mean, stick inside it. I mean, if you install an instant messaging application, you can only exchange messages with the users of, the, of that application differently from email. And so, I mean, you have, really have to install all the different instant messages if you want to talk with everybody. And if you have a new instant messaging app, it's basically useless because no users are in it and it's very hard to convince people to move in yet another instant messaging service. And so this prevents competition and prevents you from running your own services. And yeah, and we're, we're still closed in. And another topic that has gained relevance during the year is bundling. So bundling was also um, quite hotly debated and there was a last minute amendment uh, to the DMA going in, uh, at the very end of the plenary discussion in the parliament. It was the only one approved, so I mean, it gives you that idea. Um, so bundling is basically the practice through which uh, the dominant companies in one of the platform services, especially those that, for example, dominate the operating systems markets, especially mobile, but not, not, not the only ones. Uh, I mean, they, they force you or push you to use the, also their services for other services, I mean, dis disadvantaging competitors for those other services. And this is done by bundling them together, by pre-installing them. So you get your mobile phone, you already have the search engine from the same company installed uh, by using the defaults on the, on the devices by integrating them so that uh, they, they, I mean, the, the platform zone apps have a better performance because they are more integrated with the APIs and libraries and so on. And so we, we especially in the mobile uh, market, we, we really are at a point in which we have a lot of concentration. And so I, I, I before getting to the actual DMA, I, I wanted to mention a couple of technical issues that have been so the subject of meetings, let's say, uh, during this year in, in around this legislative process. And one is uh, app stores, I mean, which are, ch I mean, I think this is also an issue, especially with Apple's app store in, in the US. It is an issue mostly because of their 30% tax. So the fact that basically they, they say that if you want to, if you as a developer want to distribute an, uh, an app for, for their own, for, for iPhones, then you have to comply with their own rules. So they set the rules and you can only, I mean, the apps can only be installed if they are within Apple's App Store. I mean, basically, there's no real way of doing other things there. So App Store, the App Store is sort of a monopoly. And uh, you have to accept conditions, including the fact that if you have uh, in-app purchases, you have to give 30% as a commission to Apple, which is mm, exorbitant. And so this is a clear example of bundling, no? in which uh, many functions are bundled together, like uh, in finding apps, indexing apps, uh, showing them to you, helping you to install them, so downloading them, installing them, and then managing subscriptions and then payments. And all these, these functionalities are bundled together and you have no way to separate them. And so to pick a different provider for just one of them. Actually, you cannot pick a different provider for any of them. They are all managed by Apple and there's no alternative. And this is really not a technical need. 
I mean, we, we never had app stores in, uh, in computers. We have package managers, but they don't have all these restrictions. They don't force you to go through them for, I mean, to pay for whatever you want to do with applications. So th there was really a, a discussion on what, what is the Apple tax for? So is it for the payment system? It looks too much. It's the cost of examining the code and ensuring that it doesn't harm kids, which is what Apple says that I mean, it's one of the reasons. Nobody ever asked for this. It is, it is a royalty, but computers never work this way. So they, we never paid royalties for, just for the pleasure. So, uh, so you'll see some of the, the, the clauses in the DMA are directly targeting this problem. The other problem I wanted to mention is encryption, which is a much broader discussion, but it, it's more about the philosophical, the, the power side of the, of the DMA discussion. So first of all, I want to be clear, uh, encryption is a good thing. You should encrypt your communications. We, in, definitely I'm not in favor of state-run backdoors in, in encryption. So I'm not arguing on this. Uh, I think it's, it's good that we have been progressively encrypting all protocols in the last uh, 10 years, but there are different perspectives on this. So the problem now is that the, the discussion encryption is not really just about privacy and freedom, which is how it is commonly framed, just like, I mean, okay, let's encrypt stuff so we will get more privacy. It, it, it's, um, we will bypass censorship. It's partly that, but there are other things in it. And partly that the real point of today of the discussion around encryption is the discussion around control. So we, we are building more and more services uh, devices in our homes, but increasingly also applications on our computers and smartphones that just bring up an encrypted channel to a um, cloud service for, by, by their maker. They send data. You have no way of controlling where, where, what they send about you. You have no way of stopping them or preventing them because they don't work. If you, if you, find, if you even find a way to detect the connection and stop it, and then, then, then the device would stop working. So this is really a loss of control for users, even before than it is for governments and ISPs. And, and, uh, and, and this is actually functional to, to the preservation and in, uh, of these dominant positions and of, the, in general, the positional power of service makers. So, I mean, I, I have examples related to DNS because that's what I do, but, but it's the same with other encrypted protocols. Uh, we've seen uh, the, the move to encrypted DNS in a way that, uh, at least by some browsers, was managed so that they, they would just I mean, ignore your DNS settings and send their DNS queries to their own or, or a friendly DNS resolver in another country, which was out of reach by, by the government and, and by the ISP. And, and so this would make control impossible both by the ISP and by the government and by you, by the way. But so this is, was framed as a discussion around DNS filters. And so the first thing to say is that Europe likes DNS filters differently from the US, which is a strong First Amendment. So there are, I mean, it really depends on the country. Some countries don't filter anything, but there are many countries that really filter thousands of websites. And this is because of their cultural and values. And, but there are things that should be filtered. I mean, first of all, there's a, a growing usage of security filters, like blocking malware and phishing and botnets, which is very important for non-technical users like my elderly mom. I mean, she's not able to, you know, it's not easy for non-technical people to avoid phishing websites. And so if someone blocks for them, I mean, it's much better. Then there's parental controls, there's blocking child sexual abuse, there's blocking gambling websites, counterfeit shops. Each country has different policies and wants to block different stuff. Uh, but I mean, independently from what you think about DNS filters, the, the problem is that the, the local DNS or the local locking system is also the only control point that the government has to prevent a, a foreign uh, service operator from reaching their citizens if they don't comply with the laws. So this doesn't really completely apply maybe to big tech companies that have subsidiaries, so they have I mean, a hard presence in, in European countries. But if, for all the others, being able to, uh, to avoid the risk that the country just shuts you out of their market is, is, really, is really a game changer. And from the government's point of view, they, they are afraid of this for this exactly, this very reason. So if, uh, if everything gets uh, encrypted, DNS and also the direct communications, I mean, blocking internet platforms, blocking internet services from, from the abroad becomes impossible. And it's even worse because this is also applying to you as a user. So, I mean, I don't know if anyone else has a Pi-hole, which is a small DNS resolver you install generally on a Raspberry Pi and run it in your home. And it's something that, I mean, if, if you, all your devices use it as a DNS resolver, it will just uh, filter out your ads. It will block the connections to I mean, tracking and trackers websites and filtering and 
surveils and advertising servers. And so it's a, it's a, it's a user, I, I like this. But then if this new paradigm takes uh, ground, uh, then it, it also this kind of usage of local filters becomes impossible. So the, the message I wanted to send is that there's a growing uh, understanding in um, the, the, the discussion is around control and more is happening. It's also around centralization. So the, the very phenomenon that allowed these companies to, to grow. I mean, in the last year, we've been seeing the so-called oblivious connection model. I mean, the, the, this is sort of a scaled down version of Tor with only two hops. And uh, basically, so you, all your traffic gets uh, encrypted with a key for a second proxy, but first it gets sent to a first proxy. So the first proxy uh, gets uh, to, to know your IP address, but I mean, they also get your traffic, but it's encrypted in a way that they cannot access. So they don't know what, what the traffic is. The second proxy gets your traffic, decrypts it and sends it on. So they get to see your traffic, but they don't get to see your IP address. So this is decoupling information and making it harder actually for people to track you. And the final destination only sees a flow of, of aggregated traffic from the second proxy. So it gets even less information around uh, about you. This is what Apple has been implementing in the so-called uh, iCloud private relay, which is a new paid additional service for the moment. And uh, so they run the first proxy for everyone and the second proxy is provided by some of the, um, the big uh, dominant CDNs like Cloudflare, Fastly, Akamai and uh, the, under a contract with Apple. So what's the point here? The, the point is that uh, this can be a very good thing, uh, if you, especially if you're concerned about your ISP with, um, having a look at your traffic or if you want to bypass the governmental blocks. It re really provides you more privacy and reduces what the websites see about you. On the other hand, uh, the, the con is that you don't really get a choice over the proxy operators and even a bigger con in my view is that uh, now all your internet traffic goes through Apple. and uh, in, in the long term, the, the, the question is really what guarantees you that Apple and their supplier that provides the second proxy will never start to cross-match your data because they, if they started to cross-match your metadata at least, they would basically see all your internal traffic and they would be able to track you much better than, than you are currently being tracked today. And, and so the, there is some concern in Europe by the industry, but also by the commission, the policy environment, that um, in, in, in this might not be a desirable model for the long term, or at least there should be some guarantees and some discussions around it. Uh, so the message is that encryption is really about control. And we'll see, I guess, more legislative processes around encryption, more rules and more discussion around this. So now uh, let's get back to the actual legislative processes. Uh, so. What's been happening? Well, in the meantime, I mean, the, the legislative processes have been going on, and um, so they are proceeding. But in the meantime, uh, all the countries are starting to think, hey, maybe we can make some money. That's really the only weapon they have against the big tech companies. So I mean, they, they can find them uh, with the current, I mean, until the new rules, uh, rules get in place, there's, uh, I mean, they can only apply the all the sort of blunt rules around competition and privacy especially GDPR offers quite some, some opportunities. And so there have been lots of fines to this big tech company. I mean, this, this is just in the last 12 months. We've seen France fining basically 150 million euros Google and 60 million Facebook for the misleading cookie and the, the fact that their cookie pop-ups would basically push people to say yes and just proceed. Uh, same, I mean, Italy has been uh, finding Google and Apple for lack of correct user information on privacy treatments and, and data processing and so on. Italy has also been finding Google for Android Auto for uh, well over 100 million euros. Allegedly, they, I mean, Google was using Android Auto to shut out the competitors and, 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 some, and preventing some of the apps from being installed there. And I mean, there was a, a lot of talk at this, of this very huge fine. 1.2 uh, billion euros uh, that Italy gave to Amazon for uh, the anti-competitive practices in general in the logistics and delivery chain and so on. So this, uh, these figures are starting to get uh, higher and higher. Still, they are ne negligible. So the feeling is that uh, this is not really effective. The companies will challenge them with all the lawyers they have. And in the end, if they have to pay, they will pay. But uh, the, this is not uh, disrupting their positions. The interesting thing is now, I mean, even San Marino uh, find Facebook for four millions. And four millions might look uh, a little, but it's, uh, I mean, for a country of 34,000 people, it's actually 120 euros per citizen. 
So this is for, first of all, for some of the, big, the smaller countries, this is, might actually become a, a, a governmental business model in a way. So they, a way to get some relevant amount of, of money. So in the meantime, as I was saying, the, the legislative processes have been proceeding. These are all, all the, the things that are in, still under discussion or going on. The Digital Services Act, which is the, the part around the uh, content moderation and so the digital market sector is about competition we'll come to that data governance sector the rules for uh, open access to public data there's a new entry this year it's the computer chips act uh, because europe realized that during the crisis of the last 12 to 24 months that uh, if uh, the factories in china and taiwan stop uh, sending you chips then your all your industry has to stop because they cannot get semiconductors and, and chips and, and boards and whatever so uh, that there will be funds and policies to promote uh, the, the birth of new European factories around, I mean, to, to make semiconductors. There will be the uh, Corporate Tax Directive implementing the recent agreement uh, on uh, minimum corporate tax, in which should be at least 15%, or according to Ireland, 50% and no more than that. So that was the agreement. Uh, there, there will be the, uh, the revision of the IDES regulation, so we will get maybe a, new, a newer generation of uh, open public identities. And there's GAIA-X, which is an interesting process, uh, originally a German one, then now a European. Uh, the, the, it went through a sort of soul searching, and now it's a basically a consortium that is working on common cloud standards for portability, so uh, the, basically uh, provisions are standards that would allow you to easily move your, your applications and services from one cloud infrastructure provider to another. And uh, similarly also data ontologies for interaction. So if you want to have multiple companies in the same uh, niche working together and exchanging data to build uh, common integrated services, then you need common ontologies and, and the project is trying to work out, uh, work, basically work them out. It's been producing at the, at the moment a, a bit of software and a lot of paper, but I, I think it's getting better. So it's it's we should keep an eye over it. So, as we discussed last year, the, the remedy, one of the remedies, not the only one, but one of the remedies for the, this situation of world gardens is interoperability. So get, let's get back to the original internet principles. Let's make sure that uh, all these applications are built as modules and uh, each module is interchangeable so that you can, if you are dissatisfied with the specific function uh, as being implemented by one app or service provider, you just can switch to another service provider and everything else will continue working. And this also requires, as we were saying, uh, care, especially on mobile phone, so that uh, the user actually has the user interface uh, uh, opportunities to switch easily and pick a different uh, application and so on. And so we're trying to, to get to a world of interoperable apps in which I will only have one instant messaging application and uh, I will be able to use it to send messages to all the other IM users on all other IM applications. So I can actually pick the best one, even a new one, and move into it and then still keep my contacts. But at the same time, this will help competition since there will be a chance for people to try new and actually use new applications, even if there are no users in them yet. So what's happening with the digital market sector? So uh, you will remember that this started as a proposal by the Commission in December 2020, and the entire was, year was spent discussing the, the proposal and the public consultation, and then the Parliament took care. They started discussing it in several commissions, committees, and um, in the end, it was approved by the Parliament in first reading on, reading on the 15th of December, but the Parliament made 229 amendments. So that there were, I mean, significant changes, mostly in the direction of expanding the scope and strengthening the provision. So the Parliament is really in favor of, of this new act. Now, according to the, the legislative process, what's happening is the so-called trialogue phase, in which this Parliament approved version has to be discussed with the Commission, which of course still uh, still is, is, uh, is um, has their own initial proposal, and with the Council, so the member states that, that have maybe different ideas on what should go into the text. And uh, currently, the EU is, is uh, uh, under the French presidency. They really care about this. They want to deliver this and approve it uh, before they, ex they expire, the presidency ends uh, in June, because, I mean, for political reasons, to show that they could manage to conclude this. And, uh, and so there's a, a good chance that the trial will end in March, April, pretty soon, and then the parliament has to vote again, and the final approval could happen in the first half of 22, and uh, and so in the end, we, we could get the law in, at least approved, and then, it, of course, it will take... Uh, one, two, three years maybe for implementation and getting into force, but at least we will approve the final text. So 
the law is uh, well it was aimed at business users but uh, one of the things that actually we as a, an open source community both the, the ngos the digital rights ngos and the open source companies in europe argued for and we, we mostly made it is that it it should not really be about the business users it should also consider the end users and if you introduce the rights i mean at least the ones some of the rights those that make sense should apply to any user not just to business users of internet platforms and so that that's more, more or less happened you see the the things in italics are the changes that the parliament brought in in, in respect to the original commission proposal so uh, it's aimed at very few companies, the global gatekeepers. There's been a lot of discussion on the criteria for a gatekeeper. The, the only change at the moment that uh, the parliament made was that the threshold of turnover, annual turnover, to be qualified as a gatekeeper has been moved to 8 billion euros, not 6.5. I, I, I didn't do the math. Possibly there are some companies in the middle that were pushing for this. I don't know. In general, this is, mean, this is meant to be a new antitrust instrument for non-traditional dominant positions. So stuff the economists insist on saying, but this is not a dominant position, but still everybody else realizes it's a problem for competition. So this is the current list of covered services. So the, the first part is from the Commission's proposals. Uh, it includes marketplaces, so Amazon, Booking.com. It includes the search engines and social media, video sharing websites, instant messaging, operating systems, including mobile ones, cloud computing services, very vaguely defined, any advertising service provided by the gatekeepers in the, in the above services. And then the parliament uh, added three specific more uh, services, web browsers, voice assistants, and smart televisions. So this is the exhaustive list of what will be covered, meaning that any other type of internet product or service which is not in the list will not be covered or affected by, by these provisions, even if they had a gatekeeper in it. So the, 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 I mean, the, there are two types of provisions. The Article 5 provisions are the, I mean, the immediately executive ones. They really, you must not do this. And uh, the list is more or less the same. There were some changes, some uh, some things were moved, and we will see it. Some things were moved uh, from Article 6 to Article 5. But this is really more or less the same list that I showed uh, last year. And But uh, now we have some specific anti bundling clauses. The first one was already there. It's been refined. It's been moved, as I said, from Article 6 to Article 5 to become immediately executable by the Parliament. And it's about the fact that, uh, I mean, business users should be free to use only one of the, the services of, of a gatekeeper without being forced to use any of the others, both in terms of ancillary services like uh, delivery. I mean, for example, you use Amazon's marketplace, you must not be forced to also use Amazon's delivery service and also others. So you use a Google search engine, but you must not be required to access, uh, to be able to use a Google search to also use Google's video sharing service, for example. And... Um, then there's a new one. This was really pushed by the parliamentarians. It was a parliament uh, amendment. And uh, it's about the pre-installation. So uh, basically now uh, smartphones and devices will be required to, I mean, at the first uh, uh, installation of the device, when I mean, you first bring it up, uh, you, you, will be, you will be asked uh, which service you want. You will be given a list and you will choose, for example, which search engine you want to use. And also the, the operating system must not prevent the uninstallation of their own apps. So if you have Android, I mean, you must still be allowed to uninstall a Google search engine and maps and I mean, all the, the other apps. And, and so free up space and use something else. Then there's the interoperability clauses. And this was really the subject of a big fight for, for the community. And uh, you may remember that uh, last year, the only thing we had, uh, apart from this real-time data portability clause, which is nice, but not really very important, um, it was uh, this clause for, for interoperability for ancillary services. So the only thing that gatekeepers would be required to open up would be the, the auxiliary stuff like payments, identification and logins, delivery, advertising. Uh, now this was expanded and there's uh, an explicit uh, uh, mention of uh, access to open si operating system features so that uh, the operating system cannot advantage their own apps in, in regard to other competing apps uh, for, for access to APIs, libraries, and whatever, which is good. But then the, 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 the success we had is that we actually managed to convince the parliament to add uh, two, two clauses of, for interoperability of specific core uh, platform services. So instant messaging and social media, well, the gatekeepers of these two services, which are Facebook, the same company, Facebook, WhatsApp, Meta, sorry. Uh, they, they, will be required to open up their services and interoperate with any competitor that wants to. 
And uh, the details are, of course, not yet to be defined, but the, the clauses are there, at least in the parliament's version. So there are some concerns around this, because then, of course, the text of law only gives you a, some high level uh, definition, but then there's, uh, I mean, the, there will be an implementation phase, and even in text, uh, the, there's still a discussion on the wording. But the institution, the, the, I mean, is concerned. I mean, there are people within the institutions that are not convinced around this. And they say, we are not convinced that there is actual industry demand because they've been told by the, the, the gatekeepers, they own, I mean, also by the closed source uh, industry, that they don't want this. And they weren't uh, worried about privacy because uh, the, the father of the gatekeepers was like, I mean, yeah, but now we, I mean, we will have to exchange and send personal information to I mean, these unknown interoperating servers and it will be a nightmare for privacy. I mean, some concerns are valid, but it's not a real issue. Well, on the other hand, from the community, there have been concerns around the implementation, especially who will pick the standards, because there's, I mean, it, it makes a world of difference uh, if the standards are really open or not, uh, if, if anyone will be uh, allowed to interoperate, or if the gatekeeper will be able to set conditions, ask for money, or input uh, terms and conditions. And uh, also there was the, the initial idea that we should get interrupt for all the other core services, which unfortunately we were unsuccessful at. So there are still many open questions and uh, I mean, the technical model, uh, should this be, uh, be achieved by each gatekeeper working out their own API and exposing it, which gives them more control? Or should we actually explicitly write in the law in some way that there should be a neutral open standard, which I think would be preferable. But there's also an issue about business models. So, We've seen some moves by some of these big uh, companies, no, not uh, Meta themselves, but uh, for example, Zoom and Cisco and uh, Slack and others that have been investing in companies that have uh, to, want to provide you interop as a paid service. So I think that's any, I mean, rather than having a right to interoperate, it's a bit like privacy. It's a different view. In, in, in Europe, privacy is a right. In the US, privacy seems to be a service that you have to pay for on top of the actual service. So, I mean, again, this is a model that in Europe is, I mean, we don't, wouldn't like, and so we would have to make sure that this is not allowed. So if they, if they have to interoperate, it's not like, yeah, go, go to buy, I mean, you, you, you have to go buy interoperability from this company in which I invest and so I will still make money out of it. So this is the state of the discussion. I want to leave a little room for the discussion and then uh, happy to take quest questions and then we can follow up also in private and thank you for listening. are quite high. Uh, will the DMA actually have an effect? Well, the, the, there's still a discussion around it, so the, the trends might change. The, actually, the US is pushing the Europe them down that more European companies because I mean, because currently it's just basically about uh, US companies. But the, this really will depend also on the implementation model. So if if the gatekeepers will be forced to open up uh, and use a standard open protocol, then it's possibly natural they will start using that. If they will just be forced to open up AI, uh, close, I mean, the, their own proprietary ones, there will be interoperability with them, but I don't think that there will be any other effect in general on the entire ecosystem. Excellent. And then uh, the next question would be uh, regarding the interoperability of messengers. Uh, perhaps you can give a really short question afterwards. Uh, yeah, we can discuss in the chat um, the whole topic. Yeah, well, basically, I think that uh, I mean, the fact that you can interoperate doesn't prevent your client from, for example, deciding that they will never send a message to any Telegram user because it's insecure or that uh, they will negotiate an encryption level, which is fine for them and not accept communication. So it's still controlled by you as a, as a user. Okay, thank you.